So today I have a very special guest, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, um, uh, Brother Charles Upton. Uh, is that, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, uh, that's not too hard to pronounce, actually. Yeah. So um, he is really well read. I think you've written more than, what, 25 books at this point? It's around uh, 20, between 20 and 25. I'll have to go back and count. Yeah. And... Um, so there's many topics I'm going to be, inshallah, discussing with him over the next uh, few months, few years. I don't know how much time the brother has. Um, so we'll see what we can do. I but hope I have a few years. I hope I have got Inshallah, that. inshallah, inshallah. I want to uh, introduce you to the Muslim world. Um, and alhamdulillah, I have a very intelligent audience. And alhamdulillah... Um, a lot of them are well acquainted with uh, the social sciences, philosophy, what's happening in the world, and also traditional Islam, you can say. So it's like a, it's a good combination of. So um, even though still try to keep things simple for us, because I was watching a video of yours last night and I was like, OK, this guy is talking at like a very you know high, high speed, you can say. Um, yeah, you were talking about I aliens mean, and I use big words like antinomianism, which I can discord, you know, but whatever. Yeah, inshallah. Well, if, if I find a word that um, either I or the audience may need some explanation, inshallah, I'll, I'll let you know. But I mean, you're 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 a real academic, uh, and subhanallah, well, so the topic an academic. I'm a scholar. I'm a non-academic scholar, which it's important that people realize there's such a thing. You know, mm. it's a, the, the English have a wonderful tradition of amateur scholars who did wonderful work, but were not academics at all, mm. like um, De Quincey and actually William Blake, you know, the poet. So right, I, I, right. I, I Blake, feel yeah. myself in, in, in that tradition to some, to some degree. So. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, would that be specifically relating to like being against pro progress? that aspect of it well or against the idea of progress if real progress takes place oh okay. you know, yes. alhamdulillah, yeah. you know, alhamdulillah the myth of progress is the, problem. the myth of progress yes um okay that's another topic we'll touch on another day but today we're going to talk about uh one world religion perennialism and um something <laughs> that the article you sent me was just absolutely fabulous so before I get into that, because in that you talked about how they create extremes to create like a type of softness. I'll go into that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can explain it. But yeah. what's what is is there an attempt to create a one world religion? Let's start at that very basic question. Well, there have been a number of attempts, um, you know, g going back probably to the 19th century and um I th I think the the major attempt is for the powers that be you know, the global elites you know and and uh, who exactly they are is is a whole question in itself, but what they want to do is control the religions, you know, and proposing a one world religion is a way of attracting people from the various religions who would be more interested in that than, than in following the norms of their own faith, and that weakens the faiths. See, uh, 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 w whether a, a one world religion can be or will ever be created is uncertain, but proposing a one world religion weakens the other religions and puts them more under the control of outside forces who, who are not members of that religion or necessarily any religion. Mm. You know, I mean, there's we, we could get, get, get to a world where, uh, you know, think tanks, you know, uh, with with government and corporate running on government and corporate money, who, who may be filled with atheists, but they're very interested in religion because they want to control it. You, you don't want to let billions of people uh, get their basic worldview and their basic moral outlook from authorities that, that, that these powers do not control. That's mm. intolerable to so they've got to, you know, and uh they pretty well dealt with the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is largely just an organ of, of globalism at this point. 
So just quickly, just to give you guys an idea of the types of organizations involved in this interfaith, Abrahamic dialogue, Abrahamic uh, <clears throat> religions can be part of the solution for peace, not the problem faith leaders say. Uh, let's see if this comes up. And why do they want to create a situation where the Abrahamic faiths, including Hinduism, are all talking to one another okay because they want to negotiate and create a mindset a generation that learns all the three faiths are very similar it'll be easy to put on the temple mount where there's al-aqsa a jewish and a church and to do exactly what they did in abu dhabi abrahamic faith house in abu dhabi opens which is basically a church a synagogue and a masjid okay and so this is the Jal saying, see, I made a place for all three faiths. Something like this. Then you have the Abrahamic Institute, an educational institute promoting interfaith, intercultural dialogue and understanding. The thing you have to understand is the people promoting this stuff are secular atheists and they're promoting religious dialogue. Now, there's a lot more to this, as you'll see in the interview I do with uh, Brother Charles Upton. Over here you have CNN talking about a rabbi, a reverend, and an imam. When you have these three, uh, what does Allah say in Quran? لَن تَرْضَى أَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَنْ نَصَرَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِئَ مِنْ لَا تَهُمْ This is the perfect example. They will not like you until you follow their way. A rabbi, a reverend, and an imam have a plan for peace in middle America. Projects like this one, right? Uh, unity empowers three Abrahamic faiths. Uniquely Muslims and Jews and Christians in Greater Washington recently got together to save Palestinian lives. So this is the type of thing that is being done to put the, what do they call it, the wool, the wool over our eyes, right? This is the Tri-State Initiative. The Tri-State Initiative, okay? Um, and so... The Tri-State Initiative, same thing, uh, getting Muslims, Christians, and Jews together. And again, the question is, who's funding this? You have the Lumber Institute uh, for the Study of Abrahamic Religions. Okay, so you have these institutions, several of them, that are putting their influence and money into Muslims and Christians and Jews. Now, keep in mind, Christians and Jews already get along. So the only reason to do this is to get the Muslims to get along with them, right? And for what purpose? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that. 24 Christian Jewish Muslim leaders gather in Rome. Abrahamic faiths called for cooperation of peace. And of course, if you find something in the headlines all over, you know that there's a script and agenda behind it. Usually, Muslim, Jewish, and Christian worship comes together at a one-of-a-kind initiative. This is the One Great Peace Study Guide, a peacemaking curriculum from the perspective of Abrahamic faiths, right? But includes Hindus and all the others there, and so therefore what the Prophet said about idol worship in Arabia will if this happens, will come true, and it will come true. The Hank Center for Catholic Intellectual Heritage, a year of mercy, Abrahamic faiths in the year of Jubilee. So what's going on here? Why is the Pope so involved in this interfaith dialogue? I wonder. This is at the Emerald Institute. The role of Abrahamic faiths in making peace through societal transformation. This is a study done at Harvard University, negotiating, negotiating the path of Abraham. Okay, negotiating the path of Abraham. Why are they interested in, they already have friendship with the Jews and the Christians. Why are they so interested in, 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 in using the name of Ibrahim, like the Abrahamic Accords, and talking about how we can all come together and be one happy family? Like, the, the, there's more to it than just meets the eye. This is about the art of the three faiths, right? The art of the three faiths. So, <clears throat> this is about, uh, you know, a Jewish Muslim. Ex so, they're doing all these, <coughs> not only dialogue, but they're building places together, doing art together, doing all these initiatives together. 
This is the Institute for Advanced Studies in Levant Culture and Civilization, right? The Levant Cradle, uh, the Levant, the Cradle of Abrahamic Religions. So they're interested in studying this and promoting this. So this statement by Ambassador Gunrich on the launch of Abrahamic Faiths Initiative. Yukon's Abrahamic programs build on efforts towards peace, regional integration in Middle East and North Africa. So, why are they so interested in bring, bringing the idea of Abrahamic faiths into the Middle East? Well, you can figure it out. From here, it'll be easy for you to understand what uh, Brother uh, um, Charles Epton is saying, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, uh, Islam was a harder nut to crack, so they had to use more military force. Mm. But it's it's the same intention, which is to weaken the religions to the point where they will be under the control of of powers who are essentially not members of those religions or perhaps of any religion. So interesting, and so you know, yeah. So there is like the political onslaught, economic onslaught. There's social engineering that's coming into the family and and changing yeah. The, yeah. the traditional family setup and so that all that's left now really is the thing in the heart <laughs> which is the religion and 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 so it makes sense um politically um I, I'll, I'll come to that so you wrote an article and i'm going to try to explain it my way but then i want you to because you you definitely articulated this way better than i'm going to um, but you talked about how one of the strategies seems to be that the same people, the same forces, the same institutions, agencies that are uh, calling for uh, interfaith uh, dialogue or uh, initiatives of peace through faith um, that compromise that faith that you were talking about. They're the same ones that are also creating extremes so let's say white supremacists that are like bible thumpers or muslims who are with uh isis right who yes. are they, they're doing both of these side by side to create a situation where the common folk like me and you feel compelled to kind of like compromise in order to show we're not that yeah yeah uh, uh... Right. I mean, if, if people think that, that the only alternative to, to being, uh, you know, a true extremist, if not terrorist, w w would be to uh, follow an interfaith line where you want to de-emphasize any doctrines of your faith that would offend any other faith. I mean, you know, cr Christians would have to say, well, we don't really believe in the divinity of Christ. And Muslims would have to say, well, we don't really believe in the uncreated Quran. And, and you know, it's, it's you know, and, and uh, you know, the, the idea that, that uh, any kind of dogma is, is going to be uh, divisive. And so you, you de-emphasize dogma, even if it's the most important doctrines of the faith, and just say, let's just get along and, and be nice to each other and smile at these interfaith faith events and, and bow and smile to each other and say, we just want to be kind and this and this. And, you know, nothing much is really being said when people get together to, 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 to make such, such protestations of friendship. And it doesn't play very well on the street among the faithful of those religions, because they may look at their leaders and saying, our leaders are selling out. And, and, mm. then, and then other potential leaders come forward from a tuck theory terrorist or a, a white supremacist, whatever extremist direction and say, hey, you know, we're not those liberals who are selling out the faith. We're the real thing. Yeah. And, and both of these extremes are destructive. You know? mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, share with you uh, something that's happened in the Middle East uh, following the Abrahamic Accords. Uh, let's see if I'm able to show it to you. Uh, let's see if this comes up. So they they made this building. Uh, it's called uh, the Abrahamic Fates. Uh, so this is the declaration 
this was a document on human fraternity for world peace and living together. Oh, yeah, this right. Yes. Um, uh, th there's a Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Yahya Pallavicini, who is uh, the major civic Muslim Sheikh of Italy, and uh, he wrote a, uh, a response to this. Okay. And he, he, it was a very interesting document. And actually, I, I actually helped him edit it. You know, okay, and, he, and, and this document. Oh, yeah, I want to tell my audience something very important. You're also involved in some of these, I guess, would you call it new discoveries on Prophet Muhammad, like the documentation, the covenant? Well, uh, um, it's new scholarship. I mean, uh, a, a lot of, uh, well, you know, I mean, the, the, the story of the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon Absolutely. him, and the covenants initiative is a story in itself. So why don't we just leave a space yeah, okay, to okay, tell yeah. that story so yeah, I'm I was not just... telling you the you know. All right, inshallah. Yeah. Okay, so um, what they did in Abu Dhabi is they uh, established a building that's a church. Let's see if I can play this. It's called the Abrahamic Family House. And this Abrahamic family house is in Abu Dhabi. It's a major project. It's under the political Abrahamic Accords, where the whole Arab world is beginning to normalize its relationship with Israel. Mm -hmm. And and that, by the way, I'm going to talk about that also in a second. But the Abrahamic family house is a church, a synagogue, and a mosque, and a Hindu temple. Uh but primarily the Abrahamic uh, church, uh, church, synagogue, and mosque in one place. And uh, I wish I had a picture of it here. Let me see if this. Can you hear? Yes, I can hear. Um, no. So this is it. So the three, the mosque, the synagogue, and the church. At least there are three different buildings. None of them are traditionally designed, but that's okay. What matters is really what goes on inside them. And as you can see here, this person designs trio of multi-faith temples in Abu Dhabi. Ah, for, for those who love the generic, there we have, you know, the, the most intense generic space I've ever seen. A blank. So uh, you were saying uh, something about the design. I just wanted that to be clear to the audience. Well, uh, I don't know. It's... I, I just just personally, you know, more traditionally designed buildings of the different Abrahamic faiths would show their uniqueness because the uniqueness of the faiths is is every bit as important. Yes, yeah, this is not the faith, trying... the faiths have in common. In fact, you know, I mean, there's the, the hadith, uh, what enter houses by their doors. I don't yeah. think these buildings really have any doors, you know, the door, you know, there would have to be a, a, a true way to interfaith unity from the uniqueness of each of the religions. And that this is really eroding their uniqueness. You can, you can tell just by the way the buildings look. You know. <clears throat> yeah. And then um, I want to uh, also talk about if, if, if you can give me two minutes to sum sure. up, a point I want to make, and then I want your reflections as a teacher uh, on that. And that is, uh, let me start with the Quran in Surah Al-Kahf, which is the surah of the Antichrist or the Fitna, and it warns the Christians, don't say three, right? So this, uh, this, and then it's also alluding to in that, in a sense, that another personality will come and say, I'm also divine, or I'm uh, the, the Antichrist, the opposite of Jesus. Yeah. And then you have traditions of the Prophet saying, وسلم, the hour will not come until the Arabs start worshipping idols again. 
Okay. And so we have this interfaith building that uh, is, is, is meant to create this normalization process. But see, it's, it's, it's actually embedded in their political idea, which I'm going to show you here in a second. Um, and uh, let me just uh, get to it, inshallah, here, maybe uh, here. So this is about the Abrahamic Accords, the nature and meaning of the... So the Abrahamic Accords, which is meant to normalize relationships in terms of trade, economics, and all that, but they have a component that's religious within the, the, yes. the political uh, normalization. So over here, uh, it, you know, this person writes, the Abrahamic Accords are distinct because they incorporate into the legal rights uh, into the legal rights-based framework of a diplomatic agreement, explicit operative references to the cultural and religious traditions of the Middle East, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. So, well, that, that in itself, although dangerous, is not necessarily apostate, you know. We have to see right, what's right. being done with it. You know? Right. And so the uh, that that is correct. But the door is opened. Yeah. Or a type of, I guess, problematic situation. Oh yes, you know, and and there's a great there's a great push to uh, to destroy the uniqueness of the faiths. I mean, um, you know what what you you would know the the uh, stura and verse better than I because I'm not good at that. But you know, where does it say uh, Allah said, you know, if, if if I had willed, I could have made you one people. But instead, I, I I explicitly made you different people so that you could compete in good works. Hmm. I mean that that is is if you want to know exactly, uh, you know, one place in, in in the Quran where you have the essence of the Muslim view of interfa interfaith that is right there. Hmm. But you know, I I I have a feeling that that the idea of you know there being more than one people is being eroded. You know, by these accords. So Both you're sides. making an important point here. The point that I'm hearing is that there's nothing wrong with interfaith dialogue as long as, I guess, there is a spirit of seeking truth and understanding one another. But when the purpose of this dialogue is to eradicate the uniqueness yeah. of each uh, faith, yeah, where each faith and, and, and has to begin to come. It may never be openly expressed. It probably won't be openly expressed. We're here. The reason we're doing this is to eradicate the uniqueness of the faith. So they, this will be denied, of course, because that's not going to go over very well. But you have to look at the context. See, uh, what is really important is to see, you know, that there are many people of good of goodwill of all the Abrahamic faiths who are involved in interfaith, and they may be doing some good work. But what they don't look at is who is who is funding them, who is sponsoring them. They say, "Oh, we got a grant from this from a you know a government uh, agency or from a corporation, or this is good. They're on our side. They're doing what we're doing." No, not necessarily. They are they are determining the context in which you do things, mm. and contexts are very powerful, but they're hard to see. You know, mm. you 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 see. Well, this is our statement, and this is our action, and then yeah, but but it's all determined up to a point by the context, which is often not explicit, but is very powerful. Mm. And the people who are supporting and funding many interfaith organizations, like for example, the um, Parliament of the World's Religions, you know, mm. is one of one of those. You know, uh, uh, you know, they they uh, they know that 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 if they can provide a, a particular context for interfaith, you know, I, I mean, what ground are you meeting? You're meeting on the ground of people who may not even believe in God. These are funding sources, it, governments, you know, uh, 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 you know, foundations, you know, corporations. Are, are these, do these, are these religious institutions? Do these people believe in God? Maybe some of the people involved in this do, but a lot of them don't. Hmm. So that whole way of accepting patronage is, is very destructive if the faiths are not looking where the money's coming from. So mm. what I'm saying is instead of meeting on the ground and, and with, with the support and 
uh, funding of non-religious institutions, you know, including the UN and lots of NGOs and this, you know, uh, the, 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 if there's any way the religions can meet independent of that and then turn around and look and say, wait a minute, we've got common enemies here. Hmm. We've got common enemies in the world. Though the problem with with the uh, one of the big problems with these non-religious forces uh, patronizing interfaith movement and interfaith organizations is the unstated um, uh, the unstated doctrine is well the problem is these religions are fighting among themselves they mm. are all enemies to each other mm. and we have to we have to prevent that we have to you know get them together and make have them make friends with each other mm. what about turning around and saying wait a minute all the religions are being attacked by forces which which could be called one is liberal ecumenism which you know has no real respect for doctrine another one is um you know, fundamentalist extremism of one kind or another. And another one is militant secularism and, and uh, the new atheism. You know, there's this whole range of, of and, and then when, when, and once you turn around and say, wait a minute, we've got common enemies, you will start to say, and strangely enough, a lot of these common enemies have been supporting us all along. That's strange, mm -hmm. you know, but people don't look in that direction. You know, the money says, look at each other. Don't look at us. The, the the powers that be say, deal with each other, fight each other, make friends with each other. <laughs> what, don't look at what we're doing. So I, there needs to be a, a you know, people need to turn around 100, 180 degrees and look at what is, you know, attacking them and trying to undermine undermine all the faiths coming from the the, the world worldly powers, the powers of the dunya. So. Mm. Yeah, because there are international organizations that are funding this in the millions, yeah. Yeah. you know, and uh, uh, and and especially what's interesting, it, the Arab world is becoming the center of this more and more. Um, you know, uh, Jewish businessmen were invited to Arabia and then. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the other thing I want maybe your comment on is that when I'm looking at this from a theological point of view. Um, the commonality of a divine is is there, mm -hmm. or but what they, from an Islamic point of view, what they uh, reduce the importance of, or basically relegate to something that's not as important, is prophethood. Um, because that's where the uniqueness comes in, right? So the yes. the, the the God is common. And it is the prophets or whoever is the founder of the religion. Uh, that's what makes that religion, uh, not that Prophet Muhammad was a founder of religion, but in, in the common sense of the word. So, but the, it is it is that. So what happens is prophets become relegated to the side. And what will the Antichrist do? The Antichrist is going to come and say, I'm a prophet. And yeah. that can only happen after the credibility of prophethood as an institution is reduced. What, what do you have something yeah, to say I about that? That's a very good point. You know, and this is one of the danger. We talk about perennialism. Maybe it's it's time for, for to define what this is. Now, um, there is a school of comparative religion and comparative metaphysics. Uh, or, or of metaphysics, uh, of which was founded by René Guénon, uh, a co-founder uh, sometimes given uh, as uh, Ananda Kumar Swami, who was an Anglo-Indian who uh, wrote on traditional art in, in the, the uh, Hindu world. And then he started to write on metaphysics and, and, and he wrote from a standpoint of more than one religion. These are very important writers. And they founded a school which is now called the traditionalist school. And until his death in 1998, the school in the West, or at least in the English speaking world and Switzerland, which is where he was from, was found, was uh, uh, headed by uh, Fritjof Schoen, uh, who's a, a, a Swiss um, metaphysician who uh, became a Muslim, was a uh, uh, Initiated, uh, took bayat in the Sufi order, uh, springing from Sheikh 
uh, Ahmed al Alawi of the uh, Shadili Darqawi lineage, and, and uh, he was the founder of what is now being called the Alawiya, which I'm associated with one Silsila, one uh, lineage of, uh, of that order. Hmm. Um, so you're and, a Shadili? Uh, yes. Or, okay. you know, Shadili um, uh, Alawiya. <laughs> I will have to say that our Silsila has fallen on hard times because, you know, our, our sheikh went through a, a number of scandals like many sheikhs and many gurus do. So now, you know, we have to live with this, you know, we, 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 are, t we are living on, on the, the teachings of, of the earlier sheikhs, but uh, many of us were, are not able to follow this sheikh and his exquisite scandals. <laughs> Some of the best scandals I've ever seen. I won't, I won't tell you about them. They're just, you know, you know, of a sexual nature, which is, is usually involved in these scandals. So, so um, but anyway, may Allah, may Allah protect, may Allah protect. Yeah. Uh, if, you know, if, if, if Allah takes the sheikh away, well, we have the prophet and we have the Quran and we have the teachings of our lineage. So, you know, and, and uh, just pr pray that he, he will accept our, you know, our devotion to those and, and, and hopefully not cut us off from his baraka. So, I mean, I mean, Allahumma amin. But, um, so, you know, Fritjof Fr 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 Schoen um, wrote some amazing books. You know, I, I, I still uh, recommend his books to people who want to understand metaphysics. They're exquisite in many places. But in many places, you know, he, he in some places he has some true errors. And he he also um, was involved in a, in a lot of scandals of a similar nature. Although I, I, I will say, our, our, our sheikh outdid him, you know, in the in the scandal department. Uh, but um, and right now his followers, uh, uh, probably the, the, undoubtedly the best known of his followers who's still alive is uh, uh, Sayyid Hussein Nazir, um, who. You know, has written some wonderful books and has been a, uh, you know, has acted as a Sufi sheikh. Um, he, you know, his his tariq has seems to be fading out a bit. You know, everything's very much in flux in that world. But um, so anyway, uh, he was he was Shuan was more perhaps more than Gainon, or at least as much as Gainon was my introduction to perennialism. Now, perennialism very simply says that Allah has sent more than one valid religion uh, to humanity as ways, you know, to, to return for us to return to Him, and more than one of these religions can be operative at the same time. It does not say that that Islam, since it's the final revolution, uh, a, a revelation absolutely abrogated the earlier religions. I, I would say it has a certain preeminence of uh, because it's the, it's the final revelation of the Abrahamic line and probably of world history, but um, certainly the other religions have their own ways in which they are preeminent. You know. mm -hmm. But um, so so th this is the basic doctrine. The problem is once you say that, and once you you start to say well. What what doctrines, particularly on the very esoteric or metaphysical level, what doctrines do these religions have in common? And you start to understand these doctrines and say, well, you know, Christianity talks about God and Godhead, and and Islam talks about uh, Allah and al zat and um, you know, Judaism talks about, uh, I guess, in Kabbalah, you would say that the. the uh, you know, the tree of life and the Sephiroth versus Ein Sof, which is the, the, <coughs> the absolute unknowable essence of God. And, you know, so these are all the same doctrine. And you, that's interesting. That's worth knowing. But then the temptation is to say, and let's lift these doctrines out of the context of these different faiths and start to see more and more about how they relate. And you end up, before you know it, trying to create your own religion right. without the benefit of prophethood. Yeah, you know, and that 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 is is so perennialism is is sort of a hot seat because you're always gonna gonna have that danger, 
it's important. Now, what's important about perennialism? <clears throat> why, why should we, you know, see that these religions have similar doctrines, you know, particularly on a very esoteric or mystical level? Well, if you don't do that, postmodern scholarship is going to come along and say, well, all of the religions are mutually exclusive. We're only interested in the differences between them. And finally, you're going to define each religion as nothing but the way a particular ethnic group, um, you know, talks about itself and, and it, 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 it's its own essentially identity politics comes, in, you know, all Islam is is, is is the identity politics of the Arabs. Judaism is the identity politics of the Jews. Christianity is the identity politics of the Western Europeans and whatever. No, no. So, so uh, in other words, there's no God. There, mm. there, these are not, what these religions are talking about is not a transcendent, you know, God that, that we Muslims call, call Allah. They're just talking, it's, it's the way of an ethnic group uh, to, to, uh, to talk about itself and define itself. So mm. the religions become idols. Mm. Because they, they they lose their reference to an objective uh, reality beyond them, which is Allah. So that's that's what postmodernism is going to do if you don't watch out. Postmodern scholarship. So perennialism is important because it says no, they are referring to something real beyond mm. themselves, to God, to a living, real God. Mm. You know, but uh, at the same time, and at, at its best, perennialism says, but the uniqueness of the revelations is just as important as their commonality. Mm. You know? uh, and, and you know, uh, but I, 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 I fear that, that Fritz of Schoen mm. finally was moving in the direction, in spite of himself, and although he denied it until his dying breath, uh, moving in the direction of creating a kind of religion of his own. Hmm. You know, he, he he knew he shouldn't do it, but everything pushed him in that direction because he didn't want to follow Sharia. He didn't want to follow um, Islamic norms. And so he had to invent his own norms. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you know what happens when you start to do that? Hmm. So, so um, <clears throat> in the in the American academic world, in the Islamic departments, there is a big push uh, by different professors towards a type of perennialism. Now, I, as a student of Quran, recognize there may be some space for a type of perennial thought, but at, this, at the level of the individual in God, but not at the level of legality, not at the level of Sharia. Yeah. And so the Sharia is, you know, if, for the Sharia, if you go to the Islamic court and the Sharia says, did you say the Shahada? OK, you're not Muslim. It's very simple, meaning, yeah. you know, even, even though a person may believe la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah in his heart. But the Sharia, the, the legal, not, I won't say Sharia, the fiqh, the fiqh yeah. is going to say you're not Muslim until you don't take the Shahada. On the other yeah. contrast of that, a person can come and take Shahada. And not really believe. Right. The Sharia will say he's Muslim. So that's the legal framework, right? And then there's the individual, I I can I guess I can call it the growth that the Quran seems to allude to. Yeah. But the ultimate result of that would be under the right circumstances, is that a person would recognize, okay, Islam is an extension of what I've been going through or what I'm studying from the past scriptures to it's it's pointing towards islam and and so and then in the end result it's up to allah what allah does with the individuals mm -hmm. and and that's that's the individual in allah and and it, there's some space of perennialism at that level of the individual i feel yeah and and it, <clears throat> but also the, the the individual needs to um uh, you know con concentrate on on the level of practice and on and 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 holding to a doctrine is actually a kind of practice mm. because you know c c christians will you know look at god in a trinitarian way and uh in a real sense and then here, here's some of my what Pritchard showing called esoteric ecumenism you could say and 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 i was i'm influenced by ibn al-arabi in this 
because he had a kind of Trinitarianism as well. You know, uh, so, so so essentially, if if Allah is one, then he is one in himself, you know, uh, uh, and beyond, you know, it, this is, uh, you know, b b b before creation, Allah was alone, you know, one without a second, you know, and he's, he is even now as he was. You yes, know, he is, yes. That, that's that, famous. Uh, yeah. Aqidah of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. He is as he was. Right, and 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 then on the other hand, since since the human being appears, and and the human being is the bearer of the amana of the trust, uh, you know, and and in in, in Sufism at least is considered to to be the um, uh, epitome and 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 the synthesis of all the names of God. You know, he's he's formed upon the totality of what is Allah, and that, that that's what. That's what makes the human being uh, capable of bearing the trust in the terrestrial world. Remember, you know, uh, uh, when when uh, Allah presented Adam before the angels before ascending to the earth, you know, and He told Adam, you know, tell the angels their names if if I'm getting this right, because I'm not sure there, there are different translations of the Quran. Tell the angels their names. The angels didn't know their own names. Adam knew their names because Allah had told him because, in, or another way you say he was formed on all the names of God. So he could say, angels, this is who you are. So he had preeminence over them. And that's, of course, <laughs> Iblis did not like, so he did not bow down, you know, and so he became shaitan. But, you know, so, so he, here's the preeminence of the human being. So the essence of the human being is also Allah because Allah is the essence of everything. From, from a Sufi standpoint, Allah is ultimately the only being, because the only one who can say "I am" yeah. on his, you know, on, on his own w without being dependent upon anything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, as samad. So, uh, and, and, and and then on the other hand, here we have the the, the universe and the and, and and the power that creates, you know, all the life on earth and all the stars in heaven, you know, and 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 the, the, these. Realities keep keep appearing and keep coming, you know, fr from the deepest powers of existence, and and so the essence of of, of the universe and and the powers that create it and move it also has to be Allah. Mm. So so because Allah is one, He is, you know, Allah in Himself alone, with one without a second. He is Allah as the essence of the human being, and He is Allah uh, as the power behind the manifestation of the universe. Now, this is a trinity. Because he is one, he is the, all those three, right? Now, the, the, the Christians concentrate upon the three, and they, they, there is a great danger that, that you will have three gods. Mm -hmm. And Christians have, have fallen in, into, that, into that error more than once. Mm -hmm. In fact, our present Pope Francis said in um, a... Um, interview with Vatican Radio. It was on the Vatican website for a long time, and but I, it's gone now that I kept it. And he said, uh, he actually said, God does not exist. Hmm. He said, God does not exist. But but that's all right, because we have the Trinity. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now that is the very problem that, that the Quran warns Christians against. Hmm. And there it happened. And it, you know, it may never have happened before, or, or at least, you know, maybe, it, you know, there, there was that tendency at the time of the prophet, so it got into the Quran. But, you know, really, you know, the, the Nicene Creed of the Catholics says, uh, "Credo in unum Deum," I believe in one God, which mm -hmm. is La ilaha Allah, you know, which is Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, mm -hmm. one God, but. The, the, the Christians are given a Trinitarian way of conceiving unity, mm. whereas the Muslims are not supposed to use the Trinitarian way. Although the, the you know, even Arby, you know, says, look, it's possible to look at it this way, but that 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 is not the efficacious way in Islam. Islam, Allah is one. That's it. <laughs> you know, and when when you say Allah is one. Then ultimately you say, but then who am I? Don't I appear? Am I not number two? At least it's him and me, right? And, and, and ultimately, no. And this is why the Sufis talk about fana, That's about right. annihilation. That's right.
Because nothing exists except Allah. for Allah in its in its absolute sense. Yeah. So so you know, th th there are ways you can talk about how Trinitarianism is because it, what does it say? It says you know God is not one of three. Well, Christian tr tr Trinitarian Trinitarians do not say God is one of three. Hmm. <laughs> they don't say that. They say God is one, and and He manifests. In these three different yeah, ways. That's right. So yeah. it's not the same thing. So the, 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 there, there are places now. There are places where the Quran obviously, you know, does not go along with Christian doctrine. You mm -hmm. know, now he says, you know, he says, God, far be it from Allah to take to Himself a son. Well, Christians don't say He took to Himself a son. He, you know, that's a heresy in Christianity called adoptionism. Mm. So the, the, in a certain sense, there's more you, there's more similarity in the doctrines if you really get into them, but you got to watch out because you will never they will never be the same because you know if if Allah had willed He could have made us one one people and He He did not you know so 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 you you have to say at one point you say sorry we can't go there because that is not our way. You know, and 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 that's at that at that point, you know, the Quran says, well, then compete in good works, and and in the next world in the Akhira, uh, Allah will enlighten you as to as to things you, you disagreed about. So, so my experience with interfaith, uh, sometimes it was interfaith insanity, and sometimes it was productive. Yeah, and it depended upon the context that I was in. Um, so, but the real danger I felt was not me because I know my theology. It was the youth that were participating, that were teenagers and were not able, were, were not in a position where it was easy for them to, the uniqueness of islam didn't appear unique enough to be to be something significant in the context of of the the youthful mind mm -hmm. right so you have you have a, a masjid and they're going to have an interfaith program and they bring in their kids and they're like you know muslim christians and we're getting along and it's great and then i know why i'm i'm comfortable being me just as the 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 pastor is comfortable being him and the rabbi is comfortable in his space but the 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 spectator that is not well grounded is getting confused mm -hmm. and I, i've seen this and i've seen the results of that <clears throat> and uh because we're talking about what's always interfaith interfaith discussions 99 percent of the time they're only talking about what's common between them yes and they don't talk about what's unique what's not unique between them what's specific about them yeah and they're not and they don't usually will ask questions that will become controversial uh and uh so, so that that because you know. it's uncomfortable and people life is uncomfortable enough. And so people want something that's, you know, a vacation <laughs> from conflict <laughs> and, and vacation and from stress. The other thing that I have noticed is, especially with the rabbis, we don't bring up, bring up uh, the political scene, uh, what's happening in Palestine, uh, right. the positives and the negatives. And again, the spectator is thinking, oh, Everything is okay. There's nothing wrong going on. Uh, and I think that can be a problem because we're not teaching our kids how to engage uh, without compromising. Yeah. Yes. And it's very hard. That's why I say that an alliance against clear common enemies, against those who deny God and want to destroy faith in God in the human race, uh, you know, can 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 be fruitful because because people can certainly agree on th these people want to destroy both of us, yeah. you know. And then you we, so we 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 can we understand that there are differences between our theologies. We can bracket that, but we're not we're not going to 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 erode it. We're just not looking there now because because now 
you know, we, we, we have to we have to deal with 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 a dangerous attack, you know, and when, when an attack happens, you know, like like a a, a city which, which has, you know, a, a Christian population, a Muslim population, a Jewish population, if an outside enemy is attacking that city, these people from different religions are going to get together. And, and it's not because they're trying to look at a, a, a at a theological commonality. It's because mm. they're trying to survive. Yeah, and that's that's the adi- that's one of the attitudes we need we need to develop. So what you're saying is extremely important. What you're saying, and you can correct me. I'm going to try to give the bigger picture of what you're trying to say. There is a need to develop a relationship because traditionalists or people that have a tradition. A, tr- a tradition, whether it's the Christian tradition or the Muslim tradition or the Jewish tradition, they're all being attacked. Yeah. We're all religious people or religion is under attack. You had a whole yes. article that you sent me just on that. Religion itself is being attacked. So there is a need for interfaith dialogue. But what is but what interfaith is doing currently, it's diluting the traditional values of each yes uh in spite of itself you know I mean, in that, spite that, of that itself yes the intent of anybody involved but the context ends up producing them so it's almost like we're hurting ourselves if we're not doing this properly and if the funding is coming from sources that have their own agendas and then on top of that, we have liberalism, and then we have extremists and all the other facets that go with that. Uh, you talked about uh, militant secularism, uh, part of that too. So what we need to do is to be able to talk about Islam. in And, and see, this is not happening in the Middle East. What's not happening in the Middle East is that uniqueness of tradition. It's more like it's just a humble jumble of emotions and we're the same and we're going to trade together. And there's a big relationship. And I wonder if you would speak to this. But the idea of one world religion and global globalism. Uh, Prince Charles uh, seems to be a proponent of a type of perennialism. I don't know if you have something yeah. to say about that, but he's well, also I mean, a big proponent sure, 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 of globalism. Uh, has you know had had relationship with members, important members of the traditionalist school in Britain, and uh, uh, particularly Martin Lings, you know, who wrote that wonderful uh, uh, biography of you know Sirah of the Prophet. Uh, yeah, you know, he was, um, you know, that 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 was one of the people he consulted. And you know, as Prince Charles, I mean, I imagine he's he's initiated in more than one Sufi order, not to mention also the Druids. <laughs> you know, I mean, he says, I I I want to be, um, you know, not the defender of the faith, which is what the, traditionally the English king is supposed to be. You know, in in the Anglican system, the king is the defender of the faith. I want to be the de- defender of the faiths. Hmm. Well, that. That could be good, but uh, I'm sorry. You know what is your fit? Mm. You know, I mean, I mean, does he have one? You know, he's got a little bit of everything. And Anglicanism has pr- pretty much officially uh, uh, gotten rid of all its dogma because it's divisive. That's what the Anglicans do. You know, but we're just uh, what, what 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 we like. We have nice buildings and 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 we have we have nice uh, liturgies and and, and you know tr- traditional cultural things and we like Shakespeare and whatever you know but they they don't they don't have a, a theology and, and and they have very little faith I fear well and uh this uh gentleman that we were talking about I again have a hard time saying his name because I'm a dyslexia yeah Ren- uh, Rene Guénon yes so I wanted to uh mention this tradition of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam the Prophet said, La sa'ahat. Okay, I'll just read the English. The hour shall not be established until the tribes of my ummah unite with idolaters and until they worship idols. <coughs> now, 
one of the only ways or one of the few ways that can only happen is by a concerted effort of a type of perennialism. And indeed, there shall be a there there shall be 30 imposters in my ummah, each one of them claiming that he is a prophet. And I am the last of prophets, there's no prophet after me. The point I'm trying to make here is that when we study the person of Antichrist, right? Uh, he is someone who's going to be able to trick all. He's going to yeah. trick the Jewish people. He's going to trick the Christian people. He's going to trick the Muslim people. Which means that he will have some sort of a perennial aspect to yes. his... Yeah, and, and th th there are certain uh, negotiations that I'm, I'm not keeping up with between the Catholic Church and the State of Israel, um, which seem to me to point toward a development one. You know, I, I, I can send you an old article from the Jerusalem Post where Shimon Peres uh, went to, went to uh, Pope Francis and, and said, uh, you know, I, 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 we propose exactly this, that there should be an, an interfaith faith. And the, and the Pope nods and says, well, we'll take this under advisement. I could send that to you because it would, mm -hmm. would be an interesting way to, uh, and, you know, I, I, I should have been keeping up my research on that, but, you know, I've got a lot of things to do in life. But, yeah, uh, yeah you know, one thing, though, I, I, I want to bring in, which is <coughs> very disturbing, but, but we, we can't uh, ignore it, is there was something in Saudi Arabia where, you know, the, the idea of artificial intelligence, sentient robots, um, you know, cyborgs and this, you know, there, there, there is some real development in Saudi Arabia. And there, there was some ruling in fiqh that, that a being like this could be a Muslim or some, I forget what it was. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I you know, we, we need to research that because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the, the idea of a sentient robot, uh, what's closer to actually an idol? You know what I mean? There right, it is. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, Robots it's, are the new it's, idols. It's like a pagan statue that moves and talks. You know, right? So, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, that is true. That uh, robots are like the new idols uh, or the emerging yeah. idols, and uh, they'll just be a little bit more animated, I guess. But you know, that's where things are going. And so. Um, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. I wanted to also bring to your attention before we finished. Um, yeah, so I really do feel that things are moving very fast in the Arab world in particular. They recently built a Hindu temple that yeah. they had, the largest Hindu temple in the Middle East. And uh, there are actually Arabs who are now beginning to you know, do the whole yoga thing and the whole meditation thing and just getting into that. And and so I really, and then yeah, of I course- know, there, there, there are traditions of meditation you can get directly from Sufism. But you don't have to go to right. Hindu. Yeah. Ah. And they're much better uh, for many reasons. One of which I'll say is that, you know, in, in, in these Hindu meditations, they try to empty the mind completely, whereas we don't necessarily do that in our muraqabas. We are actually focusing on Allah or death or different aspects. I don't know if you have something to say about that. Well, I mean, I, I know that Ramana Maharshi, you know, who, who is, you know, perhaps the preeminent Hindu Arif of, uh, you know, modern times, <clears throat> He said that, that you know his his basic method was self inquiry. You say, I, "I am not the body. I am not the feelings. I'm not the thoughts. I'm not the sense even of I." You know, and you 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 finally get to tatwamasi. You know that there, there, the the only I am within the human being is God, which you know. Uh oh. Would work in a particular context is very dangerous too because you could deify the ego at one point and not even know you've done it you know but he also said whoever does japam which is zakrula exactly the same thing whoever does japam gets realization so he was willing to admit that as a way 
you know, of, of you know, of you know, in, invoking the name of Allah or La ilaha illallah or whatever. So mm -hmm. you know, there's similarities, but but you can't be a Muslim and do Hindu practices. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's just you know you you you'll create a, a an interference pattern. You know, like yeah, uh, 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 imagine you know, let's 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 put, <laughs> you put on a a, a, a you know a tape or a, a record of, of the jazz of Charlie Parker and another one of the music of Bach and another one of some other you know the Rolling Stones or whatever and all all of these may parts kinds of music may have their own virtues but if you play them together it's it's cacophony and 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 it, it distorts the soul or or you know like, like like different cuisine you mix different cuisines which are exquisite and perfect in their own right but you mix them and it's 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 sickening you know so you can't do that mm -hmm. you know and and if you realize i mean one of the better things that Fritjof Schumann said although he contradicted it in other places is that um uh, every every religion you know, contains all the religions, or let's say every religion has everything you need for salvation. If so, you don't have to mix the religions. You better choose one, because mm -hmm. if you're trying to mix them, you know, you, you, it's it's like trying, well, let's see, there are these many paths up the mountain, so why don't I go up this path? No, I'll go down, go up another path. No, I'll go down and try. <laughs> you will never get there. You'll stick never reach the top. With, stick with one, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and you, because that's inner houses by their doors. The doors are the integrity of the revelations, and if and and if you you can't enter a house through three doors at once, you run into the wall, mm -hmm. bump your nose. You know you can't do it. So, you wrote a book on this moving forward. What's the name of the book? Well, it's the way forward for perennialism after the antinomianism of Fritjof Schoen. And antinomianism just means the idea that. The uh, the Gnostic, or in Hinduism the the, the Jnani, or in Islam the Arif, or you know the, 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 the yeah. special knowledgeable person yeah. does not have to follow the law, does not have to follow the Sharia, and th that's pretty much even though Sh Shuan would never have said that, that's the way he acted, and that that was very destructive to uh, the spiritual path of a lot of his followers, you know. People have been trying after Shuan, you know, they thought they were Muslims. They realized they were not living a Muslim life. They've been spending years trying to, to reestablish Islam in, in their lives and their souls after the antics of Richard Shuan. You know, and, and the thing is, you know, his books are so profound and luminous in some ways. But until you understand his books and, and his doctrines, you won't be able to understand the contradictions in them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so if you want to go the way of studying the perennialists, you got to study them and then you got to say, OK, now where are the contradictions? So there's like two parts to this uh, course. Uh, and, 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 you know, and certainly no one has to take the perennialist way or the perennialist course in their spiritual life. It's just some people apparently need it because they have seen the truth in more than one religion and they got to make sense out of that some way. That, mm -hmm. that, that, that does not end up by destroying their faith. So That reminds me, and uh, I guess before we finish, I'll bring this up and then let you have the last word, which is that these interfaith uh, traditions or these interfaith <laughs> the ones I'll call interfaith insanity programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that is part of their intent, right? Is that, oh, there's truth here too. And oh, look, there's some truth here too. And see, we're similar here too. Oh. And that would then confuse a novice uh, because he's oh. not going to study the entire perennialist tradition to be able to see where the contradictions are. Oh. He's just going to go with the you know, uh, intensively to study his own religion. He'll just take a little bit that, that appeals to him and then something from somewhere else. I remember here in Lexington, Kentucky, we have a, a, a Christian Muslim dialogue, which uh, sometimes some interesting things have happened. It's a, it's a little exhausting to go to the, the, the meetings. Uh, but I remember there was once where uh, someone from the perennialist world uh, 
uh, came and, sp and spoke to the group, you know. And afterwards, there's a Christian, you know, these liberal Protestant Christian ministers. Those are, those are the Christians who come. And it seems like the Christians would always say, well, we don't have the whole truth. Can we have a little bit of yours, Muslims? And the Muslims, the Muslims are not so willing to say that. The Muslims, you know, believe what they believe. And the Christians are saying, I don't know. Maybe we, we, we can learn from you, you know. Or maybe, in other words, we will bring nothing to the inter interfaith potluck. You know, we'll bring an empty pot and expect you to fill our pot with your with your religion, you know, and 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 it's very draining. So this one minister came up to me and says, you know, because I'm a Muslim, and says, well, don't uh, don't uh, you know, you, we each have part of the truth, and you know, we can. And I said, so you say Christ is not enough? Is that what you say as a Christian minister? Christ is not enough, you know, and and you know, see the, the, the Christians. Christianity has had longer to degenerate than Islam, you know, and um, what happened to the Catholic Church was a disaster, and uh, it, it, it's difficult to maintain a, a traditional Christian lifestyle. You know, the, the, the uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians, actually, their hesychasm is very close to Sufism, very mm -hmm. in form. but I, I, I fear, you know, how many of them are, are now just following Russia, you know, and uh, you know, I, because my, my my wife, who is a Christian, you know, went through a period of, of a connection with the Eastern Orthodox because she, you know, she was uh, uh, initiated into the uh, Church of Shuin's Maria Mia Tarika by Sayyidina Sayyid Naz. And then she, she applied to Shuin and says, I'd like to convert to Eastern Orthodoxy. And he says, fine. But Shuin would not have said that. Hmm. And um, so she did that for a while, but then that was when we were in California, and then, then we came here to Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky, where the Eastern Orthodox are kind of Protestant-like, you know, whereas in California and San Francisco, there was a lot of old white Russians who founded the church, and they, they had an old, you know, solid piety, and, and they were very deeply anti-communist, and, you know, it's a, a different world. So now she's she's uh, in the state of a contest uh, Catholic world, which are the, the Catholics who say that all the popes since Pius XII are, are, are anti-popes, which if, if you look at what the Second Vatican Council did to the Catholic Church, that's pretty true. Mm. Uh, this was under the influence of uh, uh, Rama Kumar Swami, who was the son of Ananda Kumar Swami, one of the founders of the traditionalist school. And, uh, you know, he uh, was a um, follower of Richard Schoen, and yet when the scandals happened, he testified on them to the grand jury. Um, and uh, he didn't tell us what the testimony was because, you know, he, he you know, pledged to the grand jury not to reveal his testimony. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he, he began to distance himself from the Schoen world. He was Mother Teresa's cardiologist. Oh. And uh, he... Uh, he was trying to get her. He was. He had letters going back and forth with her, trying to get her to see how terrible the Second Vatican Council was, destroying the entirety of the Catholic Christian tradition. And she says, "Oh, oh, Ram, you're hurting Jesus. You have to. You have to follow the Pope." You know, that's that's all he got from her. Um, but uh, so so late in life, you know, he was ill. He had cancer for a long time. He. Um, you know, I think he had the last rites three times, and then he went into remission. And, and, and so, so uh, he he could no longer. He was a heart surgeon, but he could no longer practice due to his health. So he uh, became a traditional Catholic priest after that, and retrained as a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. and worked with Father Malachi Martin in the New York area as an exorcist. Oh, so a very very interesting guy, you know. So. Uh, through him, my, my I wife, can see the relationship between psychiatry and uh, exorcism. Well, you, you, you have to you have to figure out what is what is truly the demon or the jinn, and what is you know a psychological problem, and yeah. that's that's hard to do if you don't know both. You you, you can't separate them. They do they do come to operate together very often, but they aren't the same things. Mm -hmm. So. Any last uh, words about to the Muslim world and 
uh, about the dangers of one world religion and the efforts being made to that? Well, this the push for a one world religion would appear in every way I can imagine to, to, to be the, the research and development for the regime of al Dajjal, the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like to me. And, and one of your speeches, I just want to interject this, if you want to say something about that too, is that one of the ways that it may be possibly introduced into the world is through UFOs or extraterrestrial. Oh yeah, I was. Th that's that's the book I did just before the book I just did, which is called "The Alien Disclosure Deception: The The Metaphysics of Social Engineering." There's no question about the fact that many uh, of the powers that be in this country and elsewhere. Uh, uh, what's the name of the book again? I'm just it's trying to. It's called "The Alien Disclosure." Deception, the meta subtitle "The Metaphysics of Social Engineering." Um, elements of the military-industrial intelligence complex, uh, elements from from government, from the military, from the intelligence communities, from the corporate world, <clears throat> with an awful lot of obvious money behind them are pushing through every possible avenue right now the idea that you know here come the aliens you know and 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 uh, it, it's pretty clear it's it's entirely clear that 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 one of the doctrines they're pushing is the human race was not created by god the human race was created through genetic engineering by the aliens so we're to worship the aliens not god and religions, all the traditional religions will become old hat. Now that the Pentagon and, and Congress have admitted the reality of the UFOs, you know, uh, you know that this this religion stuff will be swept into the dustbin of history, and we will all perhaps the word worship will not be used, but that's what it will be. We will all worship, you know, the UFO aliens who show every indication of being none other than the jinn. Hmm. Now we're getting to a place where the jinn can suddenly operate on the human race and, and have more of an influence on the human race than they have had at any time uh, since real pagan antiquity, you know? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, 100%. So, and there are traditions of the prophet that indicate the relationship between the jal and the jinns. Yes. Um, and I've done some videos on that. But there's definitely a relationship for sure. Yes, definitely, definitely. <laughs> and you know, there there, there are elements in, in you know of, of that relationship that I bring out in my book. And you just to talk about how you know the American people since World War II at least have been prepared over a long period of time for this this shift in belief. You know, a lot of science fiction films. So some some early science fiction films were uh, produced and and written by people who who were working for the U.S. government, to, you know, in in producing propaganda films in World War II, and then they come out and start to doing science fiction films, you know, and you see and, and you see an agenda uh, to to change the beliefs of the American people and people of the world. Yeah, so, and uh, I also want to, if you don't mind, interject that. <laughs> you rabbis have said that they're talking to aliens. And a few uh, people in the Christian world, uh, pastors and priests, have said that they're talking to the extraterrestrial. And I'm then, of not course, surprised. Huh? Yeah, I'm not surprised. And of course, th there there are others who, who are, you know, th th there's a father, Spiridon Bailey, Eastern Orthodox, who has a book. You know, it's called UFO deception or something like that, and 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 he, he says, well, these are the demons. You know, which which is essentially, you know, there's a difference in in the conception of Christian conception of demons and the Muslim conception of jinn. But you know, the kafir jinn, you know, the the, the jinn who, who who are who do not follow uh, the Quranic revelation or any other revelation, but who worship their own. Kings or whatever you know their leaders are uh, are 
indistinguishable as far as I'm concerned from the Christian idea of demons. It's just that the Christians usually do not accept that there are beings of the intermediary plane where the jinn reside who are not demonic. You know, that they don't have an idea of of Christian demons, right? Like like Muslims have an idea of, mm -hmm. of Muslim jinn. But when you're talking about the, the the unbeliever jinn, they're exactly the same beings and they describe them almost exactly the same way. So yeah, this is just um <clears throat> Uh, you know, this whole NASA paid priest to figure out how to deal with aliens, UFOs, and Jews living on a different planet. That's yeah. a Jewish website. And so, uh, just... Uh, well, the, the present Catholic Church is really into that, you know, very much into that. Yeah, so it does seem, because also in tradition, how does the, the Christ or the Messiah or Mashiach come down? He comes from the sky. Yeah. Right? And so you have Jesus coming down in clouds, whether it is. And so if this event happens in some shape or form uh, in order to, you know, move things in a certain direction, uh, people of religion are going to be, they're already so watered down. Yeah. And then now this happens and they're going to be in a very vulnerable state, especially if the whole world economically politically is in a big crisis yes and and the, the, i'm i'm in touch with a group of i can only call mad scientists right now who generally don't believe in god but uh there are some people who who claim to have met these beings and they you know these are the only beings who can save us or these are the beings if, if they teach us you know telepathy and remote viewing we can use these powers to save uh, the world and 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 they they think they're some of them think that 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 they they're working against or 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 are are in opposition to the military industrial intelligence complex the powers that be who are using evil technology but we will gain psychic powers for the good and it's hopeless because mm -hmm. they're already completely determined and 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 sold out to, to the powers they think they're they're uh, they're fighting you know. So. Yeah, subhanAllah. So, okay, thank you so much. Inshallah, Allah will allow us to uh, do another program soon, I hope. Yeah, uh, the next one, well, the next one, I should just start talking about the covenants of the Prophet. Okay, Muhammad, awesome. And, 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 and the rediscovery uh, in our time and how that, that worked in relation to ISIS and a bunch of other things. Yeah. I mean, and, we became the, uh, uh, in the covenants initiative, which is our organization and now we've got a covenants of the prophet foundation which the whole thing has been sort of in suspended animation since covid came but uh we you know even even at this point i believe could be arguably called the major ideological uh opposition to isis and al-qaeda and people like that within islam Mm. You know, based upon the covenants of the prophet, which which are amazing documents, and you want to see how uh, interfaith could really work. You know, with the constitution of Medina, of course. Here you had uh, uh, facing the common the, the various religions facing a common enemy. You know, facing the Quraysh or facing the Byzantines at one point. You know, so you know th that dynamic of of banding together against a common enemy was there in the time of the prophet who yeah. was part of his 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 ministry and his will for uh for the uh political structure of medina so yeah it's it's really amazing uh because it teaches you so much about the prophet and his attitude yeah and his openness and his just like yeah, you know. yeah, and once once you 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 see what the prophet actually did with the covenants with, with the Christians and other and some with the Jews and some of the Zoroastrians and whatever, and, and and the and the constitution of Medina, then you can go back and look at the Quran and see what what was really meant in some of those ayat because you know this is what the prophet did, and so oh I see what he meant, or you can go back and you can start to win of the hadith which have you know, God knows what has become part of the Hadith corpus over the years. You know, it's very uncertain stuff. 
But if you see what the prophet actually, what his will was and what he what his actually actual practice was, you can you can look at the Quran, you know, and and say that's what this ayat meant, not this other thing, which which would have contra this other tafsir of the Quran contradicts what the prophet was doing. So yes. the, the 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 other tafsir is is obviously true. Or you can go to the hadith and say. Uh, the, the prophet here is, you know, put into his mouth things that are contradicting his actual practice yes. that we now know about. Yeah. That's why his, the historical method that we get from the West, you know, it is a really important supplement, you know, to, 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 to the, you know, the, the, the sciences of Hadith and, and, and you know, the transmission of, 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 of the doctrines because the, 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 um, the covenants actually have a paper trail. Hmm. And you, you know, and and this this is this is, is another pillar of of, of potentially of, of the Islamic tradition that that can throw light on the others. Yeah, and uh, you know, there were uh, this scholarship that you and your friend developed. Well, my 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 friend is the scholar. You know, I I, I was sort of the, uh, you know, the right hand man. <laughs> yeah, I was the right hand man. Now now. now <coughs> Coming out as myself, which is a lot harder. It was it was I I love to let him take all the blows, and I and I and I could just support him, but I I didn't have to <laughs> stand on the front lines, you know. Now now I'm more on the front lines. You know? So yeah, next time let's talk about this. These covenants the prophet made with the Christians. I didn't know that there were covenants with Zoroastrians and and others, um, that the prophet had made himself. But yeah. we mean, can probably there, get into there were some there were some Jews. And Christians that fought with the prophet in the early wars. Yes, they did. You know, and 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 you know, the, 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 there there were you know J Jewish communities in in those days. Uh, communities were 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 you know ethnic and religious much more than they are now. So uh, you you would go to a particular area, a particular township, or whatever, and. Uh, who was Christian, it would be built around a monastery. And the abbot of the monastery would be like a mayor, you know, of, of the larger Christian community. You know? mm -hmm. And some of these uh, communities of Christians were considered to be second class, if not heretical, by the authorities in, in Byzantium, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in uh, Constantinople. And so uh, uh, th they were heavily taxed and and, you know, they didn't you know they were oppressed by the Byzantine authorities, and so the prophet would, you know, send uh, uh, representatives to them before before the, the armies, before the the Muslim armies. So, okay, you know, we may be expanding into your area. Let's make let's make a covenant. Mm -hmm. You know that 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 we will uh, we will not harm you. You know because you know there's a lot of hot hot headed people in our army, and they might go after you. But we don't want this, so we'll make. You know, a covenant, and but don't show this to the Byzantine uh, Inspector General when he comes by. Just keep it in your archives, and but but when we come to your door in arms, bring it out and say, "Here's the covenant." The covenant that was made. So it was it was it was a very interesting, uh, you know, action of diplomacy that prepared the way. For the, the later political expansion of the that's the right, that's right. You know, yeah, yeah, and, and and it's no wonder it, it could have only expanded with that attitude, and yeah. this is something we will talk about, inshallah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, inshallah, Taala, we will just inshallah next continue next week or in a few days. We'll see how your schedule is. Inshallah. Okay, well, get back to me, and I'll I'll send you some things that came up. You know, some things you'll be interested in. Oh. Okay, so like Wa Rahmatullah. Well like him so